I think you have to do the work to find out how you fit into the puzzle and why it makes sense. Business of Architecture UK, episode 39. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Special announcement, the next BOA UK live event, the first one of 2019, is coming to you on Tuesday, the 5th of March. It will be held in the UNI offices, 7A Howick Place in Victoria, Southwest London, and there will be a discussion panel of industry thought leaders, in entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, architects, discussing the seven threats to an architectural practice. Now, early bird tickets are now on sale. I'm going to put the link and the information uh, underneath this podcast. So book your tickets right away, and I look forward to seeing you there. And today, I am in Islington, in Angel, East London, speaking with Haptic Architects. I had a privilege of having a conversation with Thomas Stocker, who was the one of the co-founders of Haptic, and senior associate Demetrius Argyros. Both have got fantastic uh, CVs, both educated at the Bartlett. Both have had uh, an incredible experience working on a number of different types of projects from housings to master planning to large-scale infrastructure projects. And in this interview, I really wanted to focus on how Haptic have formed collaborations with other architects to deliver large-scale projects. Now, Haptic is an off there. They've got two offices, one in London, one in Oslo. There's about 20 people in total, but they've worked on projects such as the Istanbul Grand Airport Terminal to Norwegian government buildings to master planning projects, often kinds of projects which are unaccessible for practices of that size and in this interview Thomas and Dimitri really go into a lot of detail about how they formed those kinds of alliances with other practices and how they've gone about entering competitions and how they are now working with smaller practices as well so sit back relax and enjoy Thomas Stocker and Demetrius Argyros. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and I'm here with Haptic Architects. We've got Dimitri and Thomas. Absolute pleasure to be here and fantastic to speak to you. You guys are involved in a, quite an exciting array of projects. You've got an office here and located in Norway, and you're working on residential schemes to governmental building projects to infrastructure projects and you've got a real deep culture of collaboration with other practices which I think is one of the themes which will be really good to explore today but first of all how welcome to the show obviously thank you, thank you very much thank you um, how did you get started how did the practice begin um, we started about 10 years ago and um, uh, after leaving university me and my partners, we all went to different practices. Right. And then after five or six years of doing that, we decided that we wanted to come back together and recreate some of that studio atmosphere we had mm. uh, while at university. Yeah. So we said, okay, let's do it. It's 2009, the worst recession uh, in living <laughs> memory. It's time to make the jump. So that's how we started out. And what kind of projects were those early, were you doing in the early days? Um, we really didn't have any projects when we started, so it was a bit of a leap into the dark. But um, our first project was a small garage for my uh, cousin, um, which uh, I think is actually still ongoing. It's not quite finished. <laughs> uh, so we're not very good at finishing um, projects. But um, uh, quite quickly we realized that uh, in order to um, grow the pra practice and get out of the... Uh, small project, small domestic project world, we needed to make some alliances. Yes. So uh, we reached out to some friendly offices we knew and asked if they would be interested in um, doing something together. Um, and that's really how we started to get involved in um, larger and more interesting uh, projects. Yeah, because it's, it's quite amazing that you guys are involved in working with 
Grimshaw on you know, large transport infrastructure projects. And these are types of projects that might take a practice almost their entire lifetime to start getting involved. How, do you, how did you begin to broach those sorts of relationships with large practices? What was it that you were offering them that made you attractive? I think, you know, um, as architects, we are quite friendly and we know each other and we socialize together. So we, we have some uh, relationships in the first instance. Mm. I think for the earlier projects we did uh, of an infrastructure nature were projects that were a little bit uncertain, uh, projects that uh, wasn't, where it wasn't obvious that it would go ahead and so on. So um, one of the first ones we did was for a... Um, airport up in the northern uh, reaches of Norway. Mm. Um, it's called the Arctic Circle Airport. Right. Um, it was just for a quick feasibility um, and um, we were approached by a Norwegian office called Nordic. They were a bit stretched capacity wise. The fees were very low. Um, whereas that was quite an attractive uh, uh, proposition for us as a small recently established um, office. So we did a scheme sort of roughly inspired by the surrounding nature, the local vernacular, the natural landscapes of that area, which are absolutely stunning, mm. and created some uh, very evocative images. Those images, again, they were sort of um, uh, then published around the world. Uh, they become the sort of emblem of this new airport development. Uh, little children in the local um, city built gingerbread versions of the building and so on and so forth. So. I think people could see that we brought some value to the project because it generated a sort of additional uh, value that you perhaps wouldn't get in a normal small feasibility. And what, what type of things do you think that larger practices lack, not lacks the right word, but like um, when you're collaborating with a smaller practice, what's the kind of, what's the real juice for them that becomes... What is it that they don't have that a smaller practice can have? And what is it that they've got that you don't have? Hmm. I think, uh, I mean, larger practices, they obviously know how to de design uh, and build um, large infrastructure projects for airports or whatever it is. Uh, and they could do it perfectly well without us. I think somehow though, uh, or sometimes, it's a benefit not to know too much, you know. You mm. come into things with a slightly naive perception perhaps, you might challenge or test things that you wouldn't normally test. And um, that, again, might lead to um, something else. I mean, I don't know, from your perspective, Dimitris, um, what do you think? Um, I think <clears throat> part of it is also um, driven, I think, from clients as well. I think clients, more and more we see, they really enjoy having a diversity of um, the teams. So they actually sometimes encourage that uh, there's a consortium of teams involved. So. Um, you know, which is maybe led by a big, uh, well-established um, practice that has the experience, has the capacity to deliver it, has the understanding and has, has everything in place. But also within that, um, that team, there's an, an umbrella, there are other smaller teams that mm. might offer slightly different viewpoints and different um, approaches and might sometimes challenge uh, what the norm might be perceived. And um, I think we, with infrastructure projects, it's... Um, I think we find really exciting because they are become a catalyst for development, for regeneration, for um, you know growth around. Whether it's a, and especially in the case of train stations in the heart of a city, we're working with one at the moment on HS2 with Grimshaw. Um, you know, it, it's um, there's many different layers to it. Uh, there is uh, the developments. There is urban realm. There is. Um, uh, connections with uh, uh, other transport links, so it requires a lot of different inputs, and um, and often from different practices. Uh, you know, whether it's sort of um, looking at from urban realm or from meanwhile uses. Uh, mm. So I think it, this idea that it's um, always only one team that does it is, I think, changing, and I think clients are, are uh, really enjoy. And encourage that diversity. So I think in terms of setup, uh, starting off, we, we feel that you know we're, we're encouraged to bring in, uh, to come in into those projects and um, a lot of companies now do approach us to bid with them and to um, be part of be part of their team. Mm. Um, I think there's also 
an additional benefit. I mean, we are a sort of small multinational company. Yeah. Uh, which is a total nightmare, by the way, but that's another story. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we operate in different markets, so uh, there might be opportunities that we know about in Norway, for example, that right. a UK company wouldn't necessarily know about or be able to uh, easily bid for. So we might form a joint bid uh, for that, which is an attractive proposition to them. The other way around as well, uh, we understand the UK market and perhaps uh, some of the global markets better than some of the Norwegian firms. So it's interesting for them to collaborate with us and um, uh, tag on to that knowledge. And, and so mm. how do you define the roles? So for a project hmm. like HST, HS2, hmm. how do you define, right, is it, is it as clear cut as we're doing this bit and you guys are doing that bit? Or is there a much more, you, you have a much more overview of all the different elements or how and how do you? It's obviously something like an infrastructure project, uh, you know, somewhere like Grimshaw. That the kind of way that you deal with a complex, multi-headed client. There's lots of decisions being made. Hmm. How are you involved? It it varies quite a bit. I mean, from project to project. Uh, on some projects, it's a pure equal fifty-fifty split. Right. Some might be led uh, by us. Some by our collaborators. In a large, complex infrastructure project like. Grimshaw, we wouldn't have a chance in hell of doing that on our own. It's very clear that Grimshaw is um, leading uh, the team. Mm. Uh, but we sort of um, fuse into that team, working across different sections of the uh, mm. project. Yeah. Which, which, which we also enjoy, because obviously the more we're you know, uh, part of that team, the also more knowledge we're, we're gaining uh, as well, and we're able to, you know, we're strengthening the knowledge within the practice. So. Mm. Again, we, we do enjoy that um, you know, immersive collaboration within the whole team rather than just doing a bit of, a bit of this or a pavilion here or there. It's, it's actually you know, really within the, the guts of the building, which, mm. is, which is great because uh, you know, that's where you can also have a lot of um, input. Um, yeah. you know. Could you give us an example of how, like say for example with HS2, the sort of things that you're involved and in, how you plug into the, how the team is structured? Mm. I think... Um, uh, there's um, a lot of sensitivities around HSU, yeah, so I don't know if you can... I mean, I think with it, we can use Istanbul perhaps um, mm, okay, as well, yeah. which is one we... Um, so it's a, you know, the Istanbul uh, airport, um, which is just recently completed. Mm. You were there in, uh, yeah, for the I mean, that, inauguration. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was actually a, a three-way split. Mm. Uh, there's a Norwegian company called Nordic that we work a lot with. Yep. We knew them very well. We also had, had some initial... Um, conversations with Grimshaw about doing something together. We were able to be matchmaker uh, between mm. the two to bid for the, um, the airport. In that case, it was a, a pure three-way uh, split. We formed one uh, immersive team working out of Grimshaw's offices. Mm. Right. And um, uh, I think, you know, when we do these kind of things, uh, we're always very concerned to work with practices that are genuinely interested in collaboration. Mm. Uh, mm. Some practices can be very uh, territorial or they mm. might have very distinct <laughs> design styles that they're not interested in um, compromising on. Uh, and that's great for them, but it doesn't make for good collaboration. So we always ensure that there are people that genuinely enjoy the process. And the, in the end, you know, we end up with something that isn't exactly like we would have done it, or like David have done it, or David have done it. But I think sometimes that's what makes it interesting, makes yeah. it different. Um, yeah. So, in Istanbul, we had um, we were based there for about eight months, um, mm. working on uh, the um, sort of design development. Um, so I was myself and other associates were based there for. Uh, Working as part of the team, and that was great. Obviously, learn loads, and um, you know they, they hopefully learn <laughs> from us as well. And uh, it's um, really, um, yeah, a dynamic um, uh, process. And um, so, you know, Thomas, uh, we come for reviews on a sort of weekly, uh, you know, t twice a week, or you know. So it's uh, there'll be input from all the directors mm -hmm. for three practices, um, and uh, but it you know feels like one gel team, hmm. uh, which was great. There are also other projects where we have more distinct <coughs> um, roles. You know, there might be a master plan where there are individual buildings and we right. collaborate on the master plan and then do the individual buildings. Um, 
So there's many ways to uh, cut it. The important thing is that we learn from each other and influence each other. Yeah. It's really interesting because <clears throat> with many architects that I speak to, the trying to enter into new sectors can be so prohibitively difficult mm. with needing to have evidence to, yeah. the, to very sophisticated clients of a, track, a proven track record. Mm. Yeah. And obviously a collaborative effort really, you know, that can kind of solve a lot of those issues. And it's also very good for the profession as a whole when we are able to uh, work with other practices and we're able to support each other because it lifts, it lifts up everything. Mm. So for what would your advice be to a smaller practice who wants to work on an infrastructure project or a larger um, you know, master planning project and they don't have that background? How would you suggest, what would your be your sort of keys mm. to setting up a foundation for a, a powerful collaboration? Mm. I think uh, they should come and speak to us. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I think you have to look at um, what do you bring to the um, team. Uh, and when you assess the opportunities, it's about um, understanding um, uh, why would this collaboration make sense. Because in all these things, obviously we're all running businesses. Uh, uh, collaborators are running businesses and before each collaboration everyone will make an assessment is this something we do on our own or is it something that would benefit from being um, mm. uh, having multiple heads so I think if you're a small practice you might be really good at public realm and have done something to do with that or meanwhile uses or something like that something that the larger practice might really benefit from or you might have a, a distinct knowledge of material usage or a really strong design sensibility uh, that could rub up against um, uh, the sensibilities of a larger practice. Mm. Um, so I think um, and that's uh, finding out, trying to sort of, I think you have to do the work to fit a, find out how you fit into the puzzle yeah. and why it makes sense. Um, but you, you see other examples as well. There are some practices that are very good at nurturing younger practices. If you look at Alford Hall, Monaghan Morris, they've always been very good at um, uh, nurturing practices and uh, bringing in the next generation. Um, Nordic that we collaborate with in Norway, they have um, actually had a little uh, contest where they invited uh, young startup architecture firms to present themselves uh, and they shortlisted uh, three practices that it, they will then work with in other bids. And I think it comes with uh, running a larger practice. You should take on some responsibility for the development of the industry as a, a whole mm. and uh, bring up those practices. So as our practice is now getting slightly larger, we are hoping to do the same and we would be open to collaborate with other uh, practices that are starting out or looking to get a foot on the ladder. And obviously, you don't have to start out uh, designing the uh, largest airport in the world. <laughs> it could also be uh, smaller projects that might uh, equally benefit. Mm. Uh, you know, an office building or a residential quarter or um, something else. Love it. Mm. And so can we talk a little bit about your own office structure then? How, how big is the office? And you've got one office here in London and one office in Norway. How did that come about? How does that operate? Mm. And what are the benefits and obstacles? Yeah, I mean, there's 25 of us. We're 20 in London and five and growing in Oslo. Mm. The reason we opened an Oslo office, I mean, I'm Norwegian, as you can probably hear. Um, but um, when we started in 2009, there was absolutely bugger all work in London. Um, but uh, Oslo was still, and Norway was still um, plowing on. Mm. So we were able to get a few jobs in Norway initially. Um, so we reached out an old school friend of mine and asked if he wanted to um, join forces uh, with us. So he became a fourth partner in uh, Haptic and uh, took over the, um, or set up the Oslo office. Uh, so that's uh, how we started up doing, uh, ha having these two offices. I mean, I don't know from your perspective, uh, Dimitris, how you see the collaboration within the offices and between the offices. Mm. 
I think it's um, it's a really interesting um, dynamic, and I think we will have a lot of work that comes from uh, Norway that um, um, you know also gets um, developed uh, here uh, in, in London uh, initially. And I think, as Thomas said, you know our office in London is, is the bigger make makeup uh, of, of haptic. Um, so we have that sort of capacity to be able to, you know, if it is a initial project competition, um, to, um, to to drive that. Uh, but uh, I think more and more as the office in Oslo gets uh, bigger, as the uh, um, um, and then it's sort of strength in terms of senior staff, that's uh, we all see the, the the value in that because obviously your your you know then gets is able to be developed in in. Um, in Oslo. I think we work in a quite a fluid way, so a lot of our, our staff will uh, might go f to Oslo for workshops. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's not very far uh, and you can get uh, really early flights, thankfully, <laughs> to, uh, to be there for an early Love meeting. Them. It's uh, really <laughs> enjoyable. But uh, so, you know, you, you can, um, um, you are able you know, to be involved in the sort of client meetings with that obviously have to happen in Oslo and uh, has to be a re you know, representation. Um, and um, uh, but equally, we'll have people who come to, Lond to London as well from Oslo, and we'll have workshops. Um, so, uh, and obviously through you know things like Skype and all that, it's it's, uh, it's a lot of very very fluid um, process. You know, which is a similar time scale. Uh, so it's um, um, yeah, it, it's it's a very uh, interesting dynamic. So when you when you do workshops, you mean you're kind of discussing a specific project, or you will will you take part of um, the visiting team and show them projects that you're working on here or how does that how do those kind of cross fertilization how does that work I think um, uh, it'll be both um, I mean we have uh, as Dimitri was saying some projects uh, in Norway that are being run totally out of um, London but there's still a requirement to go over to Norway and engage with the, yeah. the clients and uh, all that I think in terms of um, keeping the uh, offices uh, together and maintaining the culture but across both uh, practices, that has been a challenge in mm. the past. Um, even if you have Skype and all that, um, you all know what it's like. The sort of, uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> all that kind of stuff uh, that uh, I seem to be spending most of my working day doing. Um, but we have a principle where all new starters, they come... Uh, in Oslo, they come and work in um, London for okay. a while to get to know the people and to mm. put uh, names to faces and so on. Uh, and likewise, we're trying to encourage people in London to go to Oslo uh, regularly. I think at the beginning there was almost, uh, I remember it was the other way around as well. Like you yeah. know, there were a lot of people who, I, mean, I remember when I, I joined uh, sort of five years ago and I went straight to Oslo for a project uh, there and was based for a couple of weeks, which is great because I think also you, it's really important if you're working on a project in that country to actually be, you know, not just go to the site, but, you know, live the place a bit, you know, understand the environment, understand yeah. um, the mm -hmm. sense of place, the sense of, uh, you know, otherwise you're designing, you know, remotely without knowing the, the, the context. So that's really, really important to have that, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, understanding of, of, of the, the context. Uh, so, um, yeah, a lot of people have worked, would go to Oslo and they come back and yeah. it's, uh, you know, you so, learn so much from also, you know, going and, and working also in other um, places. You know, Norway have a fantastic uh, work um, um, ethic. You know, mm. uh, it's, uh, you know, you, uh, you, know, it's just, um, you start early, you, you know, you work, uh, you know, uh, and we're efficient and, you know, allow family time uh, at, the end, at the end of the day. Mm. And um, we which are, try and encourage that a lot in, in London as well. Mm. Often, sometimes it gets, you know, uh, mm. <laughs> Uh, changes, but it's, um, it's it's really important to understand not just about um, you know the, the, the context in terms of the architecture, but also the work ethic. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think um, uh, that's one of the um, values we try to bring with us from Scandinavia. Mm. This sort of idea that it's not just about uh, running your work is to uh, to ground through constant mm. late nights and all that. Obviously, we still have that uh, yeah. deadlines and so on, but we try to find a, a balance. Mm -hmm. In general, the um, uh, li work-life balance is a lot better in in Norway right. than in Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Uh, and there will be differences. You know, our Oslo office have better terms than our London office, for example. But 
Uh, we try to find a sort of balance and uh, make sure our staff are that's, happy. That's very interesting, actually. There's a kind of a difference in, in the culture and the lifestyle mm. of the practice that's in Norway, and that can actually be really, really beneficial to how we work in London, because London's mm. got its own mm. pace yeah. of yeah. work, which necess- isn't necessarily the best way of, mm. of always of doing things. Mm. When you say that there, there are better terms in Norway, what do you mean by that? It's, uh, it's across Norway in general, so yeah. uh, the so- social conditions are better, you have better maternity leave, paternity leave, um, uh, the salaries are higher, Right. taxes are higher too, oh. but yeah. uh, you know. Very expensive. <laughs> And um, there's um, uh, less of a culture of sort of uh, intense uh, overtime and all that, you know. And I think, as Dimitris was mentioning, you know, it it, um, increases productivity. People are forced to do things in uh, less time and uh, makes them more efficient, I think, sometimes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. Um, but we also make sure we have um, social events together. Mm. The whole Oslo crew was over just uh, yeah. last week. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And yeah. also, I mean, I mentioned you know, before as well, you know, we, uh, we have our Thursday lunch. Yeah. Uh, so at the moment, you know, we have um, uh, a few people um, are working um, in uh, the sort of bigger infrastructure projects in collaboration with others. And you know, we, we'll, um, we'll come over. Uh, you know, to, to the uh, office in Angel and uh, we'll have lunch and you know, exchange ideas, uh, experiences in that week, what we learned, what, and that's really important, really valuable, you know, so that you, you share that knowledge back to the office and other people um, learn from it. Uh, I mean, I think that's a kind of a common uh, issue, like, you know, in architecture, I guess, blinkered and sometimes yeah. of doing your thing, your, your project, and not stepping back to see actually, you know, what are we learning from this? <laughs> Why are we doing this? Yeah, Why that kind of reflective, the reflective element of aspect, practice. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think often that, col- that collaboration and also having different offices forces you to, to do that a bit more and that's, hmm. that's really important. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean we have um, project offices on uh, some of the bigger uh, projects, so our government uh, headquarter projects for example is running its entirety out of a project office uh, right, okay. uh, with the, together with the client. And uh, so the people we are working there, they spend their working day there. That's why it's extra important to have these uh, meeting points uh, social, both across countries, but also uh, within the, the individual offices. Yeah, because I suppose it's, it's very interesting that you've got <clears throat> lots of staff members, lots of part of your company actively <coughs> engaging inside of different cultural contexts and mm. different organizational contexts with different clients and different practices. Mm. And then the question is, how do you re, like, allow that to absorb back in and, and Kind of assimilate into your own mm. culture. Mm. I mean, is there is there a explicit way that you do that? Like you might review with other partners about okay, what's happening? How are you making decisions whilst you're working in this governmental project? Or mm. I mean, I think maybe to to answer some well, but there's different aspects of it. So I mean, we're, we're um, constantly um, uh, looking at our um, quality assurance, our systems, our you know, and you know, saying okay, well. We're, we're we're working on that project with that with that practice, and you know they're doing things a bit differently, a bit better. How can we learn from that? How can we sort of strengthen that side of uh, of, of the practice? And um, so there's sort of the running day to day kind of basis, which we are always reflecting on of how you know our folder structure, things like that. Um, uh, also, how knowledge is shared. You know, our, our sort of libraries are um, uh, you know being able to so actually if there's Things we've learned about um, how you do things uh, with facades on uh, in a certain project that will need to be you know um, shared with the rest of the office but, you know through internal kind of CPD or workshops or these sort of even the casual the informal lunch times. Mm. Um, so there's sort of different different aspects and uh, again on, on design and I think having this sort of, um, we have our Monday morning meeting and again we'll show projects of that are happening in Norway developments. Of those projects, people understand the challenges that happened of the previous week, how they were overcome. Mm. Uh, so it's important to kind of sh- to share all that. Otherwise, it just you know gets it's just one or two people who own that. And that's yes, the, the, the yeah. <laughs> and the danger is that if that person leaves and they've got all this experience <coughs> working yeah. somewhere else, yeah. it's, 
Yeah, it's also, you know, we learn a lot about uh, professionalism and how mm. to manage large teams, uh, how to structure projects and mm. so on that we bring into yeah. our practice, working methodologies and how you sort of set about tackling some of these hugely complex and uh, challenging uh, projects. Um, it's also, you know, just about um, pragmatics, you know, what kind of uh, video conferencing setup do you have? Uh, mm. You know, how do you deal with uh, software, timekeeping, invoicing? Yeah, we do speak to uh, our collaborating practices and others a lot about um, um, how do you manage uh, an architecture office? What's the business of architecture? Yeah, um, and uh, we also have a, a number of informal forums with uh, like-minded practices that um, we use for discussing these things and mm. learning from each other. So something called the London Practice Forum, where we um, meet and share uh, knowledge and queries, you know, what kind of professional indemnity insurance do you have? Right, and, uh, okay. Should we try and collectively um, uh, approach someone to get a better deal? Or it could be um, something like uh, London on. Uh, which is a collective of London practices that have joined forces as a kind of antidote to Brexit mm. to look at how we can reach out to other countries in Europe and in the world, um, build bridges instead of uh, walls. Are, are these initiatives that, you, that your practices set up yourself? London on we were part of uh, setting up. The other one uh, was set up by someone else. But I think there's a genuine hunger and uh, interest in talking to each other and learning from mm. each other. Yeah. It's very um, collaborative in general, at least among our generation of practices. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it's something that perhaps in, in a sort of university student culture you're not um, perhaps um, encouraged to as much or the way, the way it's taught isn't um, it's a bit more esoteric. <laughs> yes. Uh, and actually the reality is that it's becoming more and more um, collaborative, which is great. And I think you know, it's important that also that gets um, you know, encouraged even at university uh, level. Um, so it's yeah. great. So what's next? <laughs> what's happening in 2019 for haptic architects? Mm. Um, yeah, it's going to be a very exciting. Uh, yeah, I can tell you that much. We've uh, just submitted um, three competitions and uh, finishing one other. All of them are in um, uh, one form of collaboration or another. Uh, so we're very excited about um, that, feeling quite confident, so mm. we'll see. Might have to eat my word, words in uh, 2019. <laughs> we'll pause that out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, but there's, uh, there's a number of um, uh, large infrastructure projects that we are uh, positioning ourselves for, and I think we're in a good place in various collaborative um, uh, positions. We're also projects finishing as well. Yeah. yeah. We're actually building a few projects that we'll be completing. I mean, it's amazing mm. how uh, long time it takes to uh, actually build something. That's the sort of downside <laughs> of doing big uh, yes. projects. Uh, what are, what are the, what's, the, what's a short a short project for you in one of these large projects? I guess um, if you take the new Istanbul airport, it's, uh, it was from we started doing it till it completed was probably less than five years. Mm. Um, and given the size of the project, that's an absolutely incredible that's a sprint. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sprint. It's, it's, yeah, uh, amazing. Mm. But there's there's always uh, all these projects are controversial. There's always a lot of discussion about uh, various aspects. There's always a risk that they might get stopped for some reason or another yeah. or paused. Um, so we have projects still that we've had on and off, stopping and starting for probably close mm. to ten years. Yeah. We're also doing our, in parallel, we do our uh, sort of medium, smaller size projects as haptic kind of only. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what's important to have that balance as well, that you're doing these uh, projects where maybe you're able to also test ideas uh, sometimes uh, in terms of also the you know, material specification, the type of detailing, which yeah. perhaps in a big project, you know, because of the, the scale of uh, and the type of procurements and so forth might be a bit more challenging. So uh, it's important to learn from the small projects that then you can bounce those ideas into the, the larger ones. So, yeah. um, so we're finishing uh, um, some of the, um, the TBC uh, mm. 
premium penthouses, um, the apartments. Uh, we just have put up in a project for planning for a small community center as well. So um, it's, um, it's, a, it's quite nice to keep that keep that balance and mm. also ex expose to uh, expose staff to those different um, project stages as well. You know, it's important to have you know about how you build something so that you can help with the concept design of what, uh, the next project. Mm. Brilliant. No, I think that's important that you know. We also do this thing where we consider projects on the own merits. Some are suitable to do on our own. Others, we feel we need uh, to uh, join forces with someone else. Uh, um, some of our most exciting projects, like uh, a new big aquarium in Oslo, for example, that we're doing on our own. But I think you know it's the variety that uh, uh, attracts us. Brilliant. Guys, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Absolute pleasure and some real fantastic stuff yeah, there you shared. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Now, don't forget, early bird tickets are now on sale for the next BOA UK live event, which is the seven threats to an architectural practice happening Tuesday, 5th of March, 2019. Book your tickets now. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.